so we come to the last teaching in the in the trilogy of this first segment of the trilogy the favorite and i hope the imagery up front the imagery on the screens is starting to make sense of this favorite little brother who was hated by the older brothers their hatred grew and eventually we find joseph um, sold off into slavery by his own brothers and we recognize that god's god's still speaking through his word in this and god's still moving and he's speaking to his church presently out of this ancient text and today is going to be um I would say a little bit more of a hammer blow today. It's a very honest look at what God's saying and what God's calling um, those of us who adhere to his flawless word and understand that he's calling us towards himself through it. So I'm going to ask you to join me. We're going to pray real quick, and then we're going to go into it. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask um, that you would bring your word to life in our ears, in our hearts, in our minds. God, that we would understand and experience you in this text in a unique way, that you, Holy Spirit, would do the job that you have always done. You would convict us of what is sinful inside of us, and you would call us back to God. You would call us back to yourself, that we would not hide away. God, give us courage to attend faithfully to your word. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, covering up sin, um, when, when, I, when I hear that phrase, instantly into my head pops a memory I have of when my brother and I were young. And uh, we did something, there was a cover-up that took place during the Reagan administration, and it was not by the Reagan administration, it was by the Folkers brothers. And uh, my brother Link and I had decided to uh, build a bomb, and it was awesome, and it worked out about as you would plan. And um, so we built this, I still remember the gunpowder, my dad loved to hunt, and so he reloaded his own shells and stuff, and I remember pouring... Um, IMR 3031, smokeless black powder into a jar and thinking, let's build a fuse. I mean, we were, there's genius, and then just below it was the Folkers Brothers. And um, and there we are, you know, we're building this bomb, and I remember it, it didn't work, you know, and I was pretty ticked because I had great plans standing over this bomb, like, come on, buddy, blow up. Just not thinking. This hadn't developed much yet. And, um, and I'll never forget, I yelled at my brother, your bombs never work, and I turned and walked away, got a few feet away, and then, well, boom. It's like, yeah, but all of a sudden the back of my legs hurt. I was like, oh, I'm hit like Forrest. I've been bit. You know, I just went down. Um, it was terrible. It was terribly painful. And I turned around to tell my brother it worked, but he had figured out the hard way how good it worked. He was standing there when it went. He was covered in black powder burns. Thought it was smokeless. That's a lie, but we won't focus on that. Um, and, and he was at this point had small, barely visible to the eye, puncture marks starting to leak. And I was like, oh, Link, we're in so much trouble. We blew each other up, mostly you. I just, it was devastating, right? Instantly, my brother and I move into the cover-up. My brother heads inside, jumps in the shower. And I was like, oh, man, oh, man. Like, you've got the shakes. You're like, you know, just, oh, it was messed up. And he's like, I got to get to the hospital. I was like, you think? And so he's getting, we're little kids. Like mom was away for the afternoon and she trusted us for the last time. And, um, and so my brother gets out, throws on shorts and a t-shirt. And um, by that time, a neighbor had come up and I told her name was Andrea. And I said, your mom needs to give my brother a ride to the hospital. And so my brother's got towels all over him. He jumps in the back of the car. Off they go. And I was like, I think this is a good time for prayer. Reignited my prayer life. But on the way to the, the hospital, uh, my brother spots my mom's car at a furniture store. So why not run in looking like you've been shelled? He runs in. He's like, Mom, I need to go to the doctor. And my mom's like, what? You know, you can just see. He's like, it's okay. I had a bike rack. <laughs> right? That was the instructions. As he left the house, it was a bike rack. You got it, man. We are dead. You know, I just knew we were in trouble. So my brother goes to Dr. Her, and he's, ironically, he was stitching him up. And, um, and he kept saying to my mom, my mom's name is Vonnie, Vonnie, there's no road rash. You know, because usually when you use your body as a brake on the ground, it scuffs it up a little bit. There's no road rash. And some of these are just straight up like pressure wounds. This is weird. My brother's like, hmm, weird, I don't know. You know, maybe I just hit and stuck. <laughs> Plays it off. My mom is in shock. 
And so she brings my brother home a few hours later, dotted with iodine and many a suture. And we're in the car. They pick me up, and we're in the car. We're driving down the street, and this lady, you can't make this up, named Candy Sparks, um, comes up to the window. And she's like, oh, you know, praise God. We're so glad Lincoln's okay, and it's really good. And we all heard the boom. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know, that's when you're in the back seat and you just find that seam and slink into it. And I'm like, oh, I'm trapped in a two-door sedan and I'm in the back end. I know who's going to, I was trapped. I thought, oh, it's over. And my mom just looked at her like, that is the dumbest thing ever to say about a bike rack. I know, I know, mom, her name's Candy. You know, what's up? <laughs> and so we head home. Then my Uncle Boone rats us out. He calls my mom. He's like, how's Lincoln? Good. I just, it must have been a bad bike rack. And he's like, Vonnie, it wasn't a bike rack. The cover-up ceased to exist, <laughs> and the last days of my life began um, because I thought I thought it was over, right? I thought I was in a lot of trouble, but that cover-up, well, it started with us breaking a rule. Don't ever go into the gun cabinet and mess around with the gunpowder and those kinds of things, which we did not obey, and it really cost my brother. I mean, years later, they were still pulling shrapnel on me, like, I got something that hurts here. Oh, glass. It was not good. And... Um, we broke that rule, and then we started lying to cover it up. And we got in a lot, a lot of trouble. We're going to talk about a scripture today that has that same feel to it. And we're going to unpack and kind of wrestle through it and understand the weight and the magnitude of Genesis 37, 29 to 36. It is a supreme cover-up and deception. Follow along as we read. When Reuben returned to the cistern and he saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes, a sign of lament, and he went back to his brothers and he said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Fancy translation of how do we undo this, right? How do we undo this? He's not there. How do we undo the damage we have? Then they got Joseph's robe. They slaughtered a goat and dipped it in the robe. Uh, dipped the robe in the blood, and they took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether or not it is your son's robe. Hmm. He recognized it, and he said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn into pieces. Then Jacob Again, the sign of lament, he tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth and he mourned for his son for many days. All his sons and his daughters came to comfort him. It just blows my mind that he even says that. But he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I, jo I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Talk about a cover-up. Here's what we need to talk about today. We need to talk about really in two sections, and we're going to do it in two sections. We're going to unpack one, apply it, and then we're going to jump to a second one. We need to realize the fact that Satan lies. We have an enemy. It is the devil, and he lies. And today we're going to deal with that lie. The first of it is the lie of the enemy of hopelessness. It is a lie for us to be hopeless in this world. Even when we grieve and we lose something, the Apostle Paul said we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Our hope is not rooted in our life and its circumstances. It's rooted in Christ. But what we understand in this is there is a hopelessness where we reach this place where the cover-up's gone sideways, but we're still trying, and it's the point of no return. It's the point where the enemy tells us that our behavior is hopeless, that we've come to the point of no return. And here's the deal. Only Reuben, out of all the brothers, seems to understand the gravity of, of the situation. He understands that uh, the brothers, when he walks up on the brothers, now I'm, I'm imagining, and I can't, the text doesn't say this, but the brothers sell Joseph. Reuben, that must have taken some time. Reuben must go, go off and tend the flocks while Joseph's in the cistern, and then they sell him. When he comes back and finds him missing, Reuben understands the gravity of the situation and is beginning to see what they had done. Rumid's co comment must have really interrupted lunch for the brothers. What do we do now? What do we do now? 
They probably had been in a frenzy of enjoying beating the thunder out of their little brother. They were sick of this kid. They were sick of the favorite, and they put the wood to him one day. They threw him in a pit, and it just kept spiraling till he was sold to Midianite traders, slave traders. And they sell him off, make a little money, and Reuben asks the question, what do we do now? What now? It might have felt great to put the wood to Joseph, but now what? Was dad not going to ask about Joseph? Was dad not going to inquire, where's my youngest? Where's my favorite? Was dad not going to step into the equation? Reuben brings them back to reality. Now, we understand since he was gone during the sale, we, we can see that Reuben's in this place. We're going, guys, what do we do? What have you done? What is going on? And they begin to wrestle with it, and they begin to, well, they start to plot to trick their dad. See, they've done all these things wrong, but now the plot thickens, the cover-up begins, and, well, why wouldn't they just tell their dad what happened? Enough had gone wrong, right? But they don't. The plot kind of twists here. They, um, they turn and slaughter the goat, right? They turn and slaughter the goat, and what we understand is that these brothers begin to cover up the actions of their lives in such a way that, well, we got to start numbering what they've done. First of all, they've assaulted someone, right? You walk up and punch somebody in the mouth, you're going to go to court, and you're probably going to face some charges. They beat Joseph down. Then they threw him in a pit. So assault and kidnapping are now on the docket. Then they sold him, so trafficking hits the docket. In order to cover their own sin, they've assaulted, they've, kid, they've assaulted, they've kidnapped, and then they sold him to cover their tracks. But the tracks aren't quite covered. And their hatred and jealousy grew into an actual activity. In the darkness it grew, and it became something they couldn't even control. Remember as Jesus said that hatred is the same as murdering someone. If you hate someone in your heart, it's the same as murdering them. Jesus says that in the Sermon on the Mount. Do we recognize these brothers with assault, with kidnapping, with trafficking? Then it turns around, and, they, and having sold him off into slavery, they slaughter a goat. The poor goat's over there eating a rock. Just a you know, being whatever goats do with their awesome underbite, staring out at the, you know, the, the desert, and all of a sudden somebody comes up and off with his head, and they spill its blood. So now we see even the goats are getting in on the bad act because their blood's being spilled to cover up the blood of their brother, of, the, of Joseph. The, what we're seeing is six different major sins emerge out of this one act of wanton violence and hatred towards their brother. They're covering up this behavior. They're doing things... And they slaughter an animal, and then they lie and deceive their father. They lie to their father, and they deceive him. And they ask the question, is this your son's robe? So you have to ask the question now, when does the lie stop? When does the cover-up cease? Just, just humor me. I've showed you my cover-up. Anybody here ever try to cover something up? Just participate with me. Oh, thank goodness. No, go ahead. Room of pagans right along with me, right? We've tried to cover our tracks, and you ask the question, when will it stop? When will the cover-up end? They have to keep this cover-up going. It's not like his dad will be like, oh, really, Joseph? Eaten by, like, I don't know, a wild wolf or something? Okay. No. Every year his father will grieve him. And they have to watch their father mourn over a child that is not dead. At any moment, they could tell the truth and relieve his agony. At any moment, they could allow him a glimmer of hope that Joseph remains alive. They hold the keys to his suffering. And what blows my mind is it says, all his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. They came to comfort him in his grief, knowing his grief was misplaced. And this hopelessness of, <coughs> excuse me, of not being able to turn around 
was sinking in. They were covering up. They were compounding their sin. It wasn't just, you know, confessing one thing. There were multiple things going on. And over the years, they continued to lie because the deception had to continue. Jo- Jacob continued his grieving over his son. And they sat there knowing the son wasn't dead. So we're going to apply it and understand this, that we as the church need to start taking sin seriously. And the way we take it seriously is we live like this. Remember I said this a couple weeks ago? We live palms up. I actually wore a shirt today that would help remind you of it. Somebody got it? Yeah, palms up. All right. Um, So if you ever see, you're like, oh, yeah, palms up, right? We live like this. We give back to God that which he died to redeem. Jesus died to forgive our sins and redeem our lives. We live like this, and the reality is we can't let the enemy trick us as he did the brothers of Joseph into compounding into a cover-up multiple sins. Here's the truth. There's always a way out. There is always a point to stop. You can always stop the lie. You can always cease to participate in the lie and the cover-up you are creating and living into. It can always be stopped. You'll have to face the consequences of it. But why would adding to the cover-up and adding to the stacked-up pile of lies that looks like cordwood, why would that ever be more beneficial than calling stop and stepping off this, this freeway of covering up with lies? There is always a place to stop. Satan likes to make us think it's over when it's not. He think, he'll say to you, he will speak to you and say, you can never tell them they'd never forgive you. God's so disgusted with you, you can't be forgiven. That is a lie from the pit of hell. There is a point where you can stop presently. Think of it like a freeway through Atlanta. There's exits all over the place. You can get off at any point. This question is, will you? Will you get off of this? Will you stop? He tells you that you've gone too far, that there's no forgiveness and you must cover for yourself. That is a lie. You must not cover for yourself because Jesus Christ did. You must not cover for yourself because Jesus Christ's blood did. You're not bound to good behavior. You're bound to confession and repentance. Confessing to God and then repenting and turning away. It's never too late to stop. It's ironic to me that we will compound sin and dig deeper and deeper. It's kind of funny and ironic that they threw Joseph into a pit while they were digging their own. They were digging their own pit the whole time thinking they had won by throwing their brother into it. We need to understand the reality that the more we, the more we cover up, the further we dig, the further we bury ourselves. So don't be, a sin, don't be deceived in this. God takes sin seriously. It's the reason Christ died. Sin is the reason Christ died. So we as the church better take it seriously because he did. Little sins, big sins, really doesn't matter. It matters to God because sin separates us from him. So what we have to do is understand and not be deceived, not believe the lie that God is somehow unaware of, of your sin. Hebrews 4:13 says it this way and it should run a chill up your spine. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Your life, your actions matter and there is an accounting for the lives of the church. And the church better take sin seriously because when we live with unrepentant continual sin, we will give an account for it. Christ didn't die for you to just be okay with stuff. There's a time to stop and to recognize that we must lean into the hope that is only found in Jesus. Not only is God, he's not unaware of your sin. God's very much aware of it, but he's also very much able to forgive it if we would go palms up and give it back. But we think, you know what, I think you know, God doesn't need to know about that. We just tuck it away, and it rots inside of us. And we hold on to it, and we just try covering up, and we lie to ourselves, we lie to our families, we lie to our friends, and we pretend it doesn't matter when it matters supremely because Christ died to forgive it. We have to look at it 
and understand that God is able to forgive you whatever the sin. It doesn't mean you lack consequences. It simply means this. There is freedom in giving it back to Christ because you were bought with the blood of Christ to cover your sin. He went into the deepest grave, the deepest pit, and Jesus Christ came up out of hell holding the keys to death and hell, and it claims us no longer unless we choose it. And we must live in that tension. So let me ask, have you, are you sitting here going, oh my goodness, and maybe there's a sin bouncing around in your mind. You're like, I've been doing this for too long. I don't know what to do, and I don't see an off-ramp. The reality for you is if you're convicted of a sin and you've tried to bury it, remember, we've all tried to bury it, Stop digging. Stop putting dirt over it. Grab it, shake it off, and hold it out. Give it back to God. Give it to him who died in his goodness to forgive your sin and redeem your life. There is freedom in forgiveness and redemption. There is no freedom in digging a pit for yourself. Rejoice because he convicted you. If you're sitting here and something's screaming in your head, that you've been living in willful sin long enough and it won't be quiet because the Spirit of God's hitting you, I want you to hear this. He corrects those whom he loves. He corrects those whom he loves. It's not easy as a parent to correct your children. I have taken cell phones. That is a loud experience, by the way. You steal a cell phone from a child and they're like, how could you, Dad? It's all I am. And they want it back. But I'm like, I don't really care. I'm willing for you not to like me for you to understand a truth that that behavior doesn't line up with who you're called to be. When they were little, we had to spank, which is the worst. I hated that. We took toys away. I've now got a car in the family that I can steal from my son. Be like, oh, guess what? (laughs) Get your bike out, right? Um, It's awesome. It's awesome. But do I do it because I'm like, you know what? Today's a bad day. My French toast was soggy. Give me your keys. No. That's not discipline, that's a tyrant. God doesn't just hammer us for no reason. He is trying to unseat from inside of us a sin that we have hidden so deep that it might hurt coming out a little bit. I'll never forget with my older brother, he got a big knot on the right here on his leg. We we're in California by this time. And he's just like, man, it hurts to touch. So he went to uh, the doctor and the doctor cut him open and pulled out a shard of glass about that long that made its way into his leg one afternoon when he had a bike rack. And, um, and, and he pulled it out, and he's like, boy, how long has that been in there? My brother's like, two years. He's like, yeah, man, it had to come out eventually. It wormed its way up, and it hurt. But we went in and got it, right? That's what God does. He loves us. He corrects us. And he usually does it through the Word of God by the Spirit of God, Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. Here's the cool thing. This is the verse right before 13. For the Word of God is alive. It is active. It is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates, dividing the soul and the body, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden From God's sight, everything is uncovered, and it is laid bare before him whom we must give an account to. What we recognize is that we are called to live, giving it back to God. Don't hold on to that which is dying inside of you. It's sin. Give it back to him if you feel the conviction of God. Second thing is this, the lie, the second lie is, and we need to really lean in and grab this, is when you believe that all hope is lost, When you believe it's absolutely over and there's no reason to continue, that is a lie from the pit of hell. You can't believe, you can if you choose to, but you don't have to believe it. All hope cannot be lost because Christ already won. Christ already won the battle. And what we recognize in this is the story of Jacob. I want you to think with me for just a minute of what it was like. Jacob was left without hope. Notice that the boys didn't come right out and say to him, Dad, Joseph was eaten by a lion. No, what'd they do? They came up, and they were deceitful. I want you to know, all hope is not lost, but we can't sit back and believe we can trick God. We can't trick God like the boys tricked their dad. We can't live into that ethic. Their intent was to make their father think Joseph was killed. Even though they never said the words, they're still guilty of deceiving. 
They're guilty of the deception. They present evidence and wait for Joseph or Jacob to make the horrible conclusion about his own son, though they never said it. Jacob descends into grief and refuses to be comforted in any way. We can't live in these little deceptions. We have to live in the clarity of the gospel and the character of Christ. Chapter 37 ends with a small paragraph that cuts through the scene while Joseph's family is going through the motions of his death, he's still alive. All the evidence that Jacob had said otherwise. All hope was lost. His clothes were torn. He sat in mourning and in grief. And meanwhile, Joseph lived on. Joseph lived on. And I think what we have to do in this is understand that this really matters. All hope is not lost, even when evidence presents it to the contrary. All hope is not lost because there's a meanwhile in the kingdom of God. When Jacob sits with the robe of his son grieving year after year, meanwhile, Jacob, Joseph is alive. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, the chief of Pharaoh's guard. And what this does for us is it helps us make some conclusions. It helps us understand that when we look at life on the pure raw scale of what's in front of us, the evidence in front of us, and we don't take into account God's view of things, we misread what's going on. We have to understand that Jacob holding the bloody coat of his son probably made the right, you know, guess. What would we guess? What would we guess? We would make conclusions that were perfectly wrong because in God's economy, God will take the brokenness and the ruin and he will still turn it for redemption. It doesn't mean we're without pain. Jacob makes this guess of what happened to his son, not knowing that God had a plan that was still in motion. Sometimes in life, Satan tries to present us with the evidence that all hope is lost. He shows us our lost job, our sick loved one. He shows us the heartache and the pain of this world. And he makes us clean, keenly aware of the wreckage that is all around us. And he says things in our hearts and minds. It's like, how could you ever change the world? You're just one person. How could you change the world? You can't even control what you look at. How could you change the world? You can't control your temper, your shopping, your gossip, whatever. How could you? And we make conclusions based off the father of lies. When the spirit of God has spoken through his word, that maybe there's a different conclusion for us. And it's not found in our good works. It's found in who God is and the goodness of God. Because in the craziness and the pain and the reality of this life, God is still saying, meanwhile, to his church, meanwhile, you are not lost. You are dearly loved. And you are redeemed in Christ Jesus and forgiven by his death and resurrection. Meanwhile, while the world spins out of control, God has not left the throne. See, we need to understand meanwhile, because this means a lot for us. Meanwhile, God's in control while the world goes crazy. How crazy is the world right now? I mean, it's, it's going nuts outside the walls of this church. I mean, I look at what's going on in our culture and different things and how our country is split and everybody hates each other and they're screaming and yelling and the noise is so loud and meanwhile, God is in control. Meanwhile, God is not done using his church to speak the peace of Christ over a chaotic world. See, we need to be people who understand the reality and the hope that no matter what's going on, hope is not lost because the one who holds hope is the one who died to save you from your sin. The one who holds hope and purpose for you is the one who calls you by his name, not yours. The one who holds hope is the one who is still in control. He's the high king of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, whose purposes for us cannot be unseated by a lying enemy. If we would simply learn to live palms up and quit covering up and believing the lies that it's hopeless and that all hope is lost. We don't get to buy into those. Meanwhile, God is still working. We can pull people up into this church to share stories of how God's still working how God's spirit is still at work in the world, reaching those who don't yet know him. 
God's still working in this world on your behalf, on my behalf. In spite of our sins, he has forgiven us and invited us to come back to him and confess so that he could turn and transform us into the image of Christ. We live in that hope. So here's the reality. Meanwhile, while God is working, we need to trust in the character of God because why this world descends into craziness, why you and I battle covering sin, why you and I struggle with what, whether or not we hope in God enough, whether or not we are going to ever turn and live differently. Meanwhile, there is more going on right now than you can see in both the physical and the spiritual realm. But God sees it all. He remains Lord over everything. God doesn't allow us hopelessness. He invites us to trust in his character. And what we have to do is understand that we don't see the big picture. And we don't lose hope because we're awesome. The reason we don't lose hope is because he's amazing. He's the redeemer. He's the forgiver. He has drawn us out of the pit. That last song we sang, 40, he picked us up out of the pit. He found us at our lowest point when we were covered in our sins, trying to hide everything. He called us to confession, already knowing all we had done so that he could forgive us and redeem us. God already knows. For you and I, the hope is singular and it is clear. If you're in this place and you're tired of bearing the guilt and the shame, of covered sins and you feel hopeless because of what you've done or who you've been, don't be hopeless. Be hopeful in the one who has called you into his image. We, the church, live a Joseph story. That the evidence may look bad against us some days, but in the end, we are judged through the lens of Christ if we cling to him. And the first option of the Christian is to live like this and to hand back to him all that he died to forgive and to receive into us the Spirit of God that not only will continue to refine us and convict us of sin, but will transform us into the image of Christ. The goodness of God is seen in that while we can't see everything, he does, and he never loses track of one of us. He's still calling us according to his purposes. We must take seriously that which we tried to hide because it's not hidden from him to whom we must give an account. Pray with me. Lord, your goodness is unfailing. And the hope of Christ lives within us, not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus Christ is. So today, Lord, we just kind of hold on. And maybe, maybe we're like the brothers and we're covering up a lot. Pray, God, that you would rip rip away the covering and let us just stand and ask forgiveness and repent and turn away. Maybe we're like Jacob and we sit in the moment of hopelessness, of absolutely giving up all hope and just living in grief for what was supposed to happen, maybe didn't. Lord, and maybe you would give us your Holy Spirit to fill us and to speak a word over us that would remind us hope is not lost. Hope cannot be lost because it is held by the high king of heaven. So, Lord, whether we're ones who've given up hope or we're buried in the hopelessness of our own actions, I ask today that you would begin speaking a different word. And it would be a confession of your goodness. In your goodness, you chose to love us. In your goodness, you called us to yourself. In your goodness, you you scrubbed us clean in the blood of Christ. In your goodness, you are transforming us into your image. God, you are so good. And we as a church want to proclaim it. Amen. We're going to sing now a song, uh, one of my favorites. They've remade it. Passion has remade it. It's awesome. I invite you to just kind of, not just sing it, but really lean into the lyrics. You'll know the hook when we get to it. And remember, coming to him is the only option. He holds it all. He knows it all. And he's saying, come to me. Come. So I invite you to stand up and come running towards Christ. We have a value at the Foundry Church, transformation. It's one of our core values. And we tagline it with this. If you're here to stay the same, you're in the wrong place. 
and we thoroughly mean that. If you don't plan on living like this and repenting, because we all sin. I know, if you're half as bad as me, we all need to live like this. If you're coming to church to stay the same, this isn't home. This isn't the right place. Because we understand our role in this. We are people giving back to God what he died to forgive in order to become who he died to make us, the image of Christ. We are being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit into his image. It is not easy. It is costly. But the goodness of God compels us forward to trust that he's not done yet. My friends, don't take sin lightheartedly. If there is unrepentant, unchanged, unforgiven sin in your life, give it to God today. By all means, give it to God, because if you're here to stay the same, this isn't home. Christianity's not home. Christianity is the posture of people who know who they are in Christ, not in their own moral behavior. So here's my invitation today. The band's going to stay up. They're going to keep playing through, um, God, you're so good. If you have sin that's living in your life and you can bear it no more, then why bear it? Why live under this conviction and pain without response? You can respond. I'll stay down front. If you want to chit-chat after church, maybe another time. Today, I would like people to do business with God. If there's something going on in your life, it's time to give it back to God and become on the journey of stopping the sin and living in the hope of Christ. You are not bound to an unbreakable sin. You are given an unconquerable Christ to live within you by his spirit for his purposes and his will. As you go about this, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My friends, for those of you who are leaving, God bless you. For those of you who need to stay, please don't be shy. Come on down.